It was another tough day on Wall Street with the S&P 500 closing lower by more than 1%. We saw a lot of heavy selling in those mega cap tech oriented names, stocks like Apple and Microsoft and Amazon and Alphabet all really struggled here today. So it didn't allow the market to have much progress, of course, after yesterday's heavy selling uh, post FOMC decision. So we're gonna review all of that and see what it means for our postures. We do have some posture shifts to talk about in tonight's video. We're also going to talk about some history of the markets and where we've come from over the last 20 years in order to be prep properly prepared for the future and whatever is on the horizon. And then we're gonna get into our trade application example where I wanted to focus on what some call the white shoes of Wall Street and why too much of a good thing uh, can sometimes result in a bearish trade setup. So with that, Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Z. It's November 3rd, 2022. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down below into our description area where you can make sure you're signed up for our email distribution list. That way you can be notified whenever we post these videos. And remember, we also include a free perk uh, at the bottom of those emails uh, that allows you to see which stocks in the S&P 500 are giving you overbought or oversold cluster signals. In addition to that, we're heavy users of Twitter. If you're not doing so already, I would encourage you to follow me at Brandon Van Z. And we really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on these Market Outlook related posts. And then last but not least, we do have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join our group at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's trade activity. And of course, uh, today follows up the very dramatic uh, day yesterday that I'm sure uh, David shared his uh, insights with you on last night, but uh, this is my first chance to to be back with you since the big uh, event of the the Federal Reserve interest rate announcement, and uh, naturally uh, we do have uh, quite the uh, volatile trading sessions that take place around those big events, and uh, now you guys know why I use the words uh, hesitancy and skepticism as often as I did here in the last week or so, uh, as the Fed was in their quiet period immediately before that announcement. I do personally believe that had they not been in their quiet period, they would have already talked the stock market down, uh, which is why I've done a couple of bearish trades here uh, more recently with Zscaler uh, a week ago, and then of course CrowdStrike on Tuesday. And for those of you that maybe didn't notice, uh, that CrowdStrike trade was an absolute home run. If I just take a step away from this for a second, I'll show you because this is really exciting stuff, right? Uh, as I mentioned when I did the trade on Tuesday, it was a very rare trade for me because it was a very aggressively bearish trade, which is not really my MO in these videos. Traditionally, when I do bearish trades, I do more spread trading uh, where you're not necessarily going and sticking your neck on the line too much. Uh, when you're uh, buying a put, you are sticking your neck on the line and you're basically saying, I need this stock to go down. And the sharper the fall, the better uh, you feel about it. And so, um, you know, luckily it worked out to my advantage there. I didn't know how it was gonna shake out, but I just felt like the moment was right. I, I felt like a lot of the market's gains were unjustified going into this week. And uh, just the way the crowd strike chart was set up, it just seemed like it was a really interesting choice. And so this is an extremely rare case where uh, we are up 160% on this trade in just two days. Uh, and that was good for on just one contract. So I usually just do whatever the default uh, order status is. So, you know, some of you might have done more than one contract, but even on just one contract, uh, the profits uh, are over $1,200 at this point. Um, and uh, obviously that would go a long ways to pay for uh, a premium membership here at Market Scholars. That would pay for uh, over a year, actually a year and a half of our uh, membership uh, had you taken that trade. So, you know, just something to think about as we head here towards our Black Friday sale a little bit later in the month. And uh, many of you would maybe like to have that opportunity to learn about these trades while they are uh, placed, uh, as opposed to learning the, about them uh, later on in the evening when the stock market is already closed. Because remember what we do with these trades is we place them while the stock market is open. 
uh, and then we telegram out that information to our premium members as a perk. Uh, and uh, some of you may have been fortunate enough to take that trade, and if so, congratulations. That was a grand slam in the World Series right there, 160% gain in just a couple of days. Again, if you wanted to see what that chart looked like, take a look here at uh, the chart that I shared with you on Tuesday night, which was chart 3A, and here is CrowdStrike right there. And where I placed the trade was on this candle right here at near the end of the day as it was rolling over underneath that falling moving average. And this is more than I could have ever dreamed of. I figured it would be bearish, otherwise I wouldn't have taken the trade. But had you asked me point blank, uh, if I would have expected it to just collapse, uh, I would not have said that. In fact, I specifically stated on Tuesday when I was with you that my hope was that we got down here below 150. Uh, I had no idea we were actually going to go below 140 in just two days. Now remember, these are the November contracts, and so uh, I will need to likely get out of them and lock in my profits sooner rather than later. But uh, that was a rare example where I stuck my neck out on the line, and it, boy, oh boy, did it ever come through for us. So again, congrats to those of you who might have taken that trade. Uh, they come around once in a blue moon, and that was uh, a big time win there for you with 160% gain in two days. All right, let's get back on track with today's analysis here. Um, there's been more selling. Um, and so, you, you know, we saw what happened after the Federal Reserve announcement yesterday where when given the opportunity, uh, Jay Powell was more than enthusiastic to talk down the stock market. That was one of the interesting developments after um, the release of the statement that seemed like it was a little bit more dovish than it had been uh, in previous sessions. And then when Jay Powell got on the microphone just an hour and a half later or whenever it was, um, and one of the reporters said that, hey, the stock market is up off of your, uh, your decision. Is that what you had intended? And it, it just so happened to be the, that the stock market was actually a little bit lower at that time. So that reporter was mistaken. It is true that the stock market did start rallying initially after the release of the, um, of the interest rate decision. But by that point, when he had asked that question, uh, the market had already started rolling over a little bit. But what was interesting about it is the way that Jay Powell responded to that because he made it uh, very, very clear that he did not want the stock market to go up. He didn't say it, but if you listen to his response, you will hear in his tone of voice, you will hear by the way he massaged his language that his hope is that the stock market does not go up uh, because that would be counter to his direct goal of fighting inflation. And so um, yet again, it is a constant reminder that uh, you've got to be very careful if you plan on fighting the Fed. The Fed is a very powerful po force in the stock market. And right now, it's pretty clear to most people who are honest with themselves after listening to that and after kind of reading the tea leaves of the Fed uh, in recent months, quite frankly, that they don't want the stock market to go up. They will continue to fight inflation. They will continue to stamp out that inflation however they can, which the most direct tool that they have to do that with is raising interest rates. And they basically said, we haven't even given any consideration to a pause in interest rates yet. And in all likelihood, they're going to be going significantly higher before we do consider that unless we get some dramatic economic data that suggests that things are slowing down a lot more than we assume. So anyway, uh, you know, You've been warned, and remember, several months ago, uh, he came out and he basically said, "Expect pain," uh, and uh, you know I think we're we're finding out obviously what that pain feels like, and it just doesn't really feel like we're done with this yet. Hope that's uh, the case because we all want the stock market to go up, right? That that would make our lives a lot easier with our long-term investments and things like that, but. Uh, it's also important for us to be realistic about what to expect out of the market. And there's a reason that uh, we've been as hesitant and as cautious as we have here in recent weeks, despite the stock market trying to rip higher. It just seemed like it was artificially ripping higher without the, uh, the counterweight of the Fed pushing it back down. Now that they're no longer in the quiet period, they're more than happy to push that stock market back down. So here's day two after that big announcement, and you can see uh, it was not a pleasant experience here the next day either as we had more selling than buying. Now, it wasn't a complete wipeout, so we are thankful for that. But uh, once again, notice that the biggest 
squares and rectangles are the ones that are sharply in the red. Microsoft was down 2.6% today. Apple was down 4.2% today. Visa was down 3% today. MasterCard was down over 3% today. Alphabet was down over 4% today. Amazon was down over 3% today. Those are some of your heavy hitters when it comes to the stock market's perspective, especially when it comes to something like uh, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite, which are market cap weighted. And those are the key components within those groups in many cases. And therefore, there was basically no hope that the stock market could be up today, uh, even if you had a lot of the smaller players that were doing their best to kind of keep things afloat. So a really difficult day there uh, for a lot of those uh, types of areas that um, are attracting our attention here uh, recently, especially the technology mega cap giants that are out there. After the bell tonight, there were a bunch of fintechs that reported. Uh, it looked like Square slash Block was up. However, PayPal uh, was down, so a little bit of offsetting forces there. So keep in mind, we are still going through earnings season. Kind of feels like we went through the big chunk of it last week, but there's still hundreds of companies that still need to report their earnings. So stay tuned to those reports as well as they have uh, a, an opportunity to uh, change the sentiment on Wall Street uh, if the reports are jolting enough. Also keep in mind that we're not done with the excitement in the market yet because tomorrow is the jobs report. Remember the first Friday of each month is the jobs report. And so uh, tomorrow's the first Friday of November and uh, we'll have another opportunity for the market to either try to collect itself after a couple of days of selling or perhaps uh, we'll start seeing even sharper selling into the uh, into the close. Uh, remember, we've actually had a couple of good Fridays in a row here uh, where the stock market was up, but prior to that, it felt like this that, that Fridays were usually pretty ugly. So it'll be interesting to see if we kind of click back into that more bearish treatment heading into the weekend there. Um, and so it's going to be uh, quite an interesting day uh, tomorrow as well. Uh, so buckle up. Uh, it should be uh, some opportunities for those of you that are a little bit more active on the trading side of the equation. Uh, remember, David will be teaching his technical analysis class tomorrow as well. So uh, he will already be kind of delivering his immediate reaction to the jobs report uh, during his uh, class for his premium students tomorrow. Anyway, let's talk about some of the, uh, the green squares here. It's always more fun to talk about those that go up, right? Uh, and there were a, a handful of them that are, are noteworthy. Boeing has been rather impressive. This week, some of you saw me tweeting about Boeing here. I think it was either yesterday or the day before, where there was there was some new commentary out from uh, their executives regarding their dividend policy. Many of you know that with all of their uh, struggles and controversies with uh, their plane development and, of course, COVID in recent years, they had to cut their dividend. But uh, there is a possibility of them reinstating it. It's just that you might have to wait a little bit longer than you had preferred. So for the uh, for another day here this week, it was up yet again. Uh, up 6%. And remember, Boeing is part of the aerospace and defense industry group within the industrial sector. And we've talked a lot about stocks like Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed, uh, L3 Harris. Um, it, a lot of those have been kind of you know, discussed in these presentations and my other classes this year because of their direct um, association uh, with the Russia-Ukraine situation. But a lot of people do forget that Boeing is also uh, one of the premier defense contractors in the United States. A lot of people just assume that they are on the commercial side of the business, which it, it is true. They obviously uh, dominate that line of business alongside uh, Airbus over in Europe. But uh, Boeing also is a very important player in defense contracting. And so it is possible that maybe the sentiment is starting to change a little bit there for the better for Boeing after their trading has been uh, a little bit more uh, constructive here in recent uh, sessions. Also notice that uh, Caterpillar and John Deere were both up a couple of percent here today as well. Some of the railroad companies were up. Uh, you saw that General Electric and Honeywell were up. So it does seem like um, there is continued strength 
within the industrials. There's Emerson, by the way, they just raised their dividend yet again. Not only are they a dividend aristocrat, but they're a dividend king with more than 50 years in a row of increases. In fact, I think it's more than 60 years in a row for them. Um, so they were up 2.4% here today uh, as well. But remember, this is a continued theme. Remember in the um, Tuesday sessions where I'm with you, I, I talk about the sector selector tool. And we've been noticing that uh, the industrial sector has been in the top four uh, for several weeks in a row now at this point. And so this is something that maybe not a lot of people are talking about, but if you kind of peel back the, the, the layers of the market, you will find that there has been some nice resilience within the industrial uh, sector specifically. So keep your eye on that in case we do get some sort of a reversal higher, right? I'm not expecting that. I think we're probably due for uh, you know a time where we're uh, given back some of those gains that we had back in October. But if you have a differing opinion or if you're just willing to go counter to what the rest of the market is doing, uh, there is relative strength within the industrials area. So keep a, keep a pin in that idea. Uh, you'll also find that there is strength in the in, in, in the energy patch, right? And how many times have we said that this year? Uh, remember on Tuesday when I was with you, I had mentioned that it was the fifth week in a row that energy was number one on the sector selector. So, uh, and they had a good run earlier this year as well, where they actually went three straight months being at the top of that tool uh, without relinquishing that prime spot. And that is very, very difficult for any one of the 11 sectors to pull off. So the fact that they were able to do that earlier in the year was rather impressive. And uh, their last you know month or so has been uh, quite impressive as well. So more good times rolling there uh, with some of those energy stocks. I did see that ConocoPhillips came out with a dividend increase announcement here today. You can see that stock was up about 6%. Uh, so apparently the market was enthusiastic about that. Um, otherwise, there really wasn't too much bullishness out there. It seems like most of the other sectors had a few stocks that were bullish, a few that were bearish, uh, but not a whole lot of consistency across the board. So the big takeaway here is it was yet another day of mega cap tech just basically strangling this market and not allowing it to have any progress, uh, which is especially uh, unnerving after yesterday's uh, statement from, from Jerome Powell. Remember, the further that interest rates go up, the less likely that long duration assets like technology stocks uh, can outperform. So they're in a major bind right now. And in addition to that, of course, they've outperformed for many years leading up to 2022. So there's always the philosophy that they need to give back a lot more uh, here whenever the markets do turn on them. And that's what we're witnessing right now. All right, let's go ahead and pop back on over here to the main part of the platform and I wanted to look at some breadth numbers. Now I've got the S&P 500 pulled up here and you can see that we had 202 stocks out of the S&P 500 that closed higher today. So that was only about 40% of stocks closing in the green. Remember we've had a few of those sessions in recent weeks where there were actually more stocks that were up than that were down, but because of the specific stocks that were down being the mega cap tech stocks, the overall S&P 500 fell. Today was not one of those days. Today was definitely a bearish breath day and it wasn't just an excuse to wave our fingers at Apple and Microsoft. Sure, they, uh, they did a lot of damage, but it wasn't just them. Uh, more than half of the market was lower here today and with the S&P 500 closing down by about 1%, I would say it was probably well-deserved in that particular case. Let's go ahead and pop on over here to our charts now. And typically when the market is down 1% or even up 1%, I like to start our conversation with chart 6D. Remember, as part of the uh, premium uh, package that we offer to uh, our members, they get access to all 50 plus charts that David and I use. And so it allows you guys to, to not only uh, follow along during our premium trading rooms that we teach each day of the week, but also follow along in these free presentations here on YouTube a little bit more thoroughly. Now this particular chart is basically going to give us an opportunity to look at um, volatility through a slightly different lens and help us absorb what's been going on a little bit better. Up at the top, you're going to see the pathway of the S&P 500. 
Now, remember when I was with you on, I think it was on Tuesday. If, it, if not, it might have been the prior Thursday. Sometimes it's hard to remember exactly when I said what. But I remember bringing up the chart, the monthly chart of the S&P 500, when I was talking about my skepticism uh, pre-FOMC announcement uh, and why I was very hesitant going into that, talking about how we had not broken out of the downtrend yet. And despite the rally and all that you know, great, great stuff that we saw uh, out of the market in the month of October, we were still in a downtrend. Trend. And it kind of felt like a lot of um, stock traders were in la la land, uh, thinking that good times were here yet again. And I just didn't really ever buy into that thesis as a result of the, the quiet period uh, discussion I had with you earlier. But here is another kind of good way to see that a little bit more obviously. Um, and when you look at that activity up here, to me, it's pretty clear that we remain in a downtrend. You have very defined lower highs that are taking place here, and you also have very defined lower lows. And we're rounding the corner yet again. And so brace yourself. I know this isn't uh, a fun uh, you know, theory to, 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 to post or to, to discuss at this moment, because again, we all like to see it when the stock market goes up, but uh, you can see that there should be a pretty reasonable opportunity for the stock market to even break where we were trading here in the middle of October. So just be careful, right? Um, you know, I, I, wanna, I remember one of the times when we were in this really big run up in the market, I was mentioning how, uh, you know, that would be an opportunity to lighten up on your bullish positions or put on new bearish trades like I did with CrowdStrike here on Tuesday or with Zscaler, you know, on the trade before that, you know, and I think that was a good opportunity to kind of uh, reestablish bearish trades while the rest of the market was kind of in la la land. And you can see here in the last four days, we've had four straight down sessions now for the S&P 500 with the last two being particularly violent. Yesterday's of course stretched down well below this 2% uh, sell off area. And then today's followed on and tacked on in an additional 1% uh, sell off here uh, today. Notice that the VIX was down. But it wasn't down um, a, a, a whole lot, or I should say it didn't move a whole lot. And that's what is a little bit peculiar about this. Typically, when you have a really aggressive move lower on the um, stock market, you find that the, the VIX will go up pretty dramatically, right? All else being equal, they're pretty inversely correlated. But if I were to pull up the VIX right now and show you, it to you in a little bit better detail, notice that the VIX has barely even budged at all this week, despite the stock market rolling over aggressively. So you got to figure something's going to give. And you know, I would venture to guess that what's going to give is that the VIX is going to have a spike at some point. Uh, we shall see. But uh, it has been that has been one of the more confounding things about this. Um, market sell-off, and especially in the last couple of the days, is the lack of movement out of the VIX. When normally, if you would have had, you know, a three percent move over the course of two days, um, it would have been uh, a VIX that would have gone up by maybe like four or five points, something like that. And instead, we've basically just gone flat. In fact, another thing that you guys might have saw me uh, tweet yesterday. It actually got to be a little bit viral. Uh, and I think it's because that uh, Twitter account Zero Hedge retweeted it. So thank you to Zero Hedge if you're listening out there. Uh, but anyway, that, 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 that tweet of mine got about 300 and some likes and it was discussing the last 90 minutes of yesterday's uh, sell-off uh, or yesterday's session in general. And then comparing that to the 90 minutes of other Fed days throughout history. And since 1994, there has not been a sharper sell-off in the last 90 minutes of the, of the session on a Fed day. Uh, that was the worst we've ever seen yesterday. That was it. Um, in other cases, you find that the language of the actual statement of the interest rate kind of matches the tone of the Fed chairman and their, you know, uh, their 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 interviews and and conferences afterwards, but this was a kind of a unique situation where the uh, stock market initially applauded the uh, interest rate decision, which of course was 75 basis points, which everybody was expecting. Nobody was expecting that it wouldn't be. So that's not what shocked the market. What the market really wanted to know is what that meant for the future. 
And when the uh, interest rate decision was released, there was some language in that decision that suggested that the Fed was going to be uh, more open-minded around some of the key data points like the stock market and how that might affect uh, the psychology and the, and the economy and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it was a unique situation where the initial response of the market was to the upside. And then in the last 90 minutes of the session, exactly when Jerome Powell is getting interviewed by all the reporters and he's clarifying his stance that he is not going to you know, give up on this goal of stomping out inflation and he doesn't care who he has to hurt along the way in order to accomplish that goal. Um, you saw this massive whipsaw where you went from sharp enthusiasm with 1% gains to the upside to just despair by the end where you gave up all of those 1% gains and then added an additional 2% loss on top of that. And so that was very abnormal what we witnessed there. There's always a bit of um, whipsaw action. In fact, we talked about that specific possibility yesterday morning in my factor-based swing trading class with my premium members to give them a heads up as to what to expect. But it's usually not that extreme. So that's another thing that was really interesting about yesterday's uh, activity was just how big of a whipsaw it was. And you do not see that all that often. The other thing that we kind of talked about um, in one of my classes, it might have been in my class this morning for my question and answer session with my premium students is, you know, a lot of the participants in the stock market are somewhat new. I think there was a statistic that I had retweeted out there um, maybe a, a month or two ago that talked about how 15% of market participants here in the United States, at least, just started investing um, in 2020 or later. Remember, there were a whole bunch of people that got there. Remember when, when those TikTok videos were going uh, viral and everybody was talking about their stimmies, uh, the young person's language for stimulus checks and how they're going to put all that into the stock market and chase all these stocks like GameStop up and all those cryptocurrencies like Dogecoin went to the moon and all that fun stuff. Yeah, it seems like a lifetime ago. But that was actually just within the last couple of years. Anyway, um, when you have a brand new crop of folks that enter into the stock market that have no experience dealing with legitimate market pullbacks previously, you can understand why the market is in this highly trained mindset of buying every dip. But for those of you like David and myself that have been around the block a time or two, remember we've been trading since the dot-com days and many of you have been trading even prior to that perhaps. So we at least know what happened in the dot-com era. We also know what happened in 08, 09 where you know, there is just true despair out there and people just literally giving up on the market. And while this year has felt really brutal because there has been some extremely sharp pullbacks in prices, there hasn't really been that capitulation like I give up moment. <laughs> we just haven't seen it yet. We haven't even seen the VIX spike to 40 yet, right? And so that's why I think you sense that David and I were probably a little bit more hesitant and cautious going into that Fed announcement yesterday than the average person out there. Um, a lot of people have been trained in the last couple of years to buy every dip and they've always been rewarded for that. And so it makes sense that that's how they would behave this time around. And when the stock market started rallying right here over the last month or so, then the whole acronym of FOMO came out once again as well. And that's, of course, fear of missing out. And so once that rally took hold, all those people wanted to jump on that gravy train because they've been trained to do so in recent years, and it's usually worked out with success. And so that's where a lot of those folks are truly disappointed right now because you just gave back probably a week's worth of the most important part of that rally last month in just you know the last couple of days right here. Um, one thing that I was mentioning with my students earlier today is if you use this chart 6D and then um, change the time period to uh, 20 uh, years and then change the aggregation period. So I'm gonna click on this time frame right here and then change it from a one month aggregation period to a year and really broaden things out we have to remind ourselves that we have been incredibly blessed as investors in the last 20 years, right? And this has been the majority of my career here. My career in the investing world is probably, you know, back to 22 or 23 years, so just beyond this, but this does represent the biggest chunk of my time in the market. 
And I have recognized, and I hope many of you have as well, we have been incredibly blessed here in the United States stock market. Um, if you don't count this year, what we're all going through right now and everybody's having indigestion over, you will see that we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That year was a wash, so we won't count it. Uh, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years of up uh, years in the last 20. 15 out of 20 were up and technically you could include this other one that you can barely see here because if you included dividends with that on a total return basis that was an up year as well. So technically it was 16 out of 20 years the stock market has been up. So should it be a surprise to any of us that the stock market is down this year? Obviously, we know that bear markets are a rule. They're not an exception to the rule. They will happen, and the sooner you learn that, the better it will be for you in the future when other bear markets will eventually emerge as well. And I think this kind of helps us take a, 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 you know, a 30,000 foot view of the market and reminds us that yes, we need to go through years like this and like this and like this because we got years like that and that and that and that. And those are all 20% plus years. Heck, just last year, the market was up 27%. This year at this moment in time, it's down 21%. So we haven't even given back one year's worth of gains yet, despite how a lot of people just feel like they're pulling their hair out this year. So, you know, it's important for you to gain that perspective and context if you're going to be successful in the markets. Markets move in cycles. We're currently in a, in, a, in a down move in the cycle and bearishness is on the horizon, right? And it's entirely possible we'll be going through an economic recession. If that's the case, people are going to lose their jobs and home values are going to come down and profits are going to be slimmer than they were in previous years. And stock market participants usually don't like that type of behavior and price those stocks accordingly. So, you know, it's, it's important that we all get our financial houses in order, so to speak, make sure we're not doing crazy things uh, with our money, make sure that we're uh, doing the best we can to manage and mitigate the risk that is ever present within the markets. All right, uh, enough with that. Let's get back into the, the typical routine with our four grid right here. And you can see here that the S&P 500 did go back to a weekly bearish posture after four days of selling. We're back to that time period uh, or back to that, that posture uh, device. And the reason for that is the green line, the, uh, the intermediate line, fell out of the upper reversal zone. Remember on the market uh, forecast technical indicator, the upper reversal zone is 80. So you can see in the label here, it's at 79 and falling. And therefore, we're back to that weekly bearish posture. Now, having said that, I, I will give it a, a little bit of credit here for stopping where it did on the market. In other words, it stopped right on the 30-day moving average here today. Let me uh, right-click and zoom in on this a little bit better so you guys can see that a bit better. Notice where we closed today, basically sitting right on that moving average. So that puts that, that sets up the possibility that if the market likes what it hears out of the um, jobs number tomorrow, that we could get a bounce tomorrow, right? I don't know what the likelihood of that is, but um, it's certainly a possibility now that we're at a more rational support bounce area. And we have had four days in a row of selling. Remember, stocks typically don't go down every day and they don't go up every day. So there's always those reversion to the means that happen in the short term. So we could very well be due for a little bit of a bounce here. And technically, that would make sense sitting right at the 30-day moving average. But keep in mind what the market is looking for tomorrow is a little bit peculiar to those of you that might be newer to um, you know, this line of work because what the market wants to see tomorrow is actually terrible job numbers. If the job numbers are robust and everybody has their jobs and is gaining more jobs and you know uh, their, their income is going up and bonuses are going up, that may sound good on the surface to a lot of people who think, yeah, hey, when the, when the economy is strong, the stock market is strong. Well, remember, we're in like opposite world right now. Remember, I've talked about uh, George Costanza uh, in, in, in these presentations uh, this year talking about that concept of it's opposite day. Uh, do the opposite of what you think. And tomorrow, actually, what you want to see if you want to see the markets be resilient to the upside is you want to see a terrible jobs number because that would then give the Fed some firepower to get a little bit more dovish in the future. 
But if the jobs market is red hot tomorrow, the stock market will probably sell off on that information, despite how contrary that sounds on the surface, because it basically suggests that Jerome Powell's work is not anywhere near done yet. And if the job market is hot, uh, he's going to have to continue to raise interest rates sharply into the future. So it's going to be interesting to see how that all shakes out. But going into that number, you will see here that we are now at that weekly bearish posture on the S&P 500. The other thing I wanted to point out, I talked about this in one of my premium classes, but I wanted to mention it here in this uh, free YouTube video as well, is that notice we do have a bearish near-term divergence going on here on the S&P 500. Now remember, I brought up that bearish near-term divergence when we talked about Zscaler as my bearish trade idea a week ago, and CrowdStrike actually had it for my trade on Tuesday as well. So um, the thing that I was mentioning to my students today is if the S&P 500 has that setup, then a lot of companies are probably going to have that setup as well. That's just the nature of indices being made up of a lot of stocks. And so notice that we have this uh, high on the near-term line right here on October 25th. We have this follow-up high on that blue near-term line on the 31st, and clearly that second high is well below this first high. And as those the candles that are associated with that were going up at that time, right? Uh, it went from here to here during that time period when the underlying indicator went down. So that was kind of giving us a heads up as well in recent days, in addition to, of course, uh, you know, my commentary on the quiet period. But technically speaking, you also found that there would have been something you could have sniffed out ahead of time that would have suggested that all was not as well as you might have assumed had you just been watching CNBC and watching stocks go up day after day after day. There was some slippage taking place underneath the surface. Let's talk about the Dow now. The Dow has been our leader in this run, right? We've talked about that endlessly. Not only has the Dow been a leader on the up days, but the Dow has also been the leader on the down days. And that um, philosophy held true yet again here today. Notice that the Dow was only down 0.46% today. It was the best performer. The S&P 500 was down over a percent, 106. Uh, the NASDAQ was down 1.73%, and the Russell 2000 was down 0.53%. So the Dow was once again the leader. Now, this is not quite as uncommon, right? I was trying to emphasize for you guys along the way in recent weeks how uncommon it was for the Dow to lead to the upside. So that was the uncommon part. This is what you would more come to expect, what we witness today. On days where we have a sell-off in the market, the Dow is filled with those big blue chip companies that tend to go down less than other more aggressive and cyclical and you know, tech-oriented and innovative and disruptive types of companies. So it kind of played that role today of being, you know, a, a capital preservation tool on a relative basis. And you'll notice that because it's not giving back those oversized gains that it originally received, it still has the blessing of the strongly bullish posture. So where we have a bearish posture on the S&P 500 and also a strongly bearish posture down below on the NASDAQ composite, we still have strongly bullish postures on the Dow Jones and on the Russell 2000. But I'll reiterate what I mentioned on Tuesday, which is in, from my perspective, the Dow is stronger than the Russell 2000. First of all, you've got a bigger air pocket to overcome between this and the 30-day moving average, which as you can see is still rising. Um, but in addition to that, you can see that the uh, intermediate reading at 88 is still well above the eight intermediate reading of 82 on the Russell 2000. So the Dow remains our leader, um, and uh, it was really interesting to witness its, its outperformance on the upside. But remember that presentation that I gave you here last week where we kind of stack rank the Dow Jones components, and I was talking to you about how um, it is a very peculiar index in that it is uh, put together and constructed based upon price per share. It is not market cap weighted like the other indices. And so that certainly plays a role in their outperformance here recently because it just so happened that the highest price stocks within the Dow were the ones that were doing the best. And so uh, it's a little bit of a peculiar situation, but nonetheless, there's still a lot of money that tracks the Dow, right? The, the DIA, as an example, as an ETF, uh, is still a very influential ETF. So you can you know, uh, argue with their construction till you're blue in the face, but it doesn't really matter. It still has influence in the markets, and right now that is our leadership group. 
Um, you will see, as I mentioned before, the, the NASDAQ, no surprise, they've really taken it across the chin because, again, mega t cap tech has been so out of favor. So they are the laggard. If the Dow is the leader, the NASDAQ is uh, the laggard. And that's really how it has been for this entire move, right? Even in the up move of the NASDAQ, it was not going up at the same ascent that the Dow was. And so when it came time for the market to get bearish again, like it has in the last couple of days, no surprise because it didn't have enough gains to give back, it's gonna be the one that is most likely to break its mid-October lows the first. So uh, you're not all that far away from it. it. You know, If it's a really bad day in the market tomorrow, heck, it could happen tomorrow. You might be at 52-week lows on the NASDAQ tomorrow if the market doesn't like the jobs number. So uh, clearly still in a downtrend there with the NASDAQ composite. And then the Russell 2000 is holding up a little bit better. Remember, they don't get impacted as much uh, from a currency perspective when the US dollar is stronger. So that might be kind of in their corner at this moment in time. You also have a lot of financials in the small cap universe, a lot of mom and pop regional banks out there. Uh, and financials have held up a little bit better uh, than some of the other sectors out there. So, you know, Credit where credit is due, uh, Russell 2000 has held up there pretty nicely. And they're sitting at a kind of an interesting level of support as well. Notice that this prior resistance area back here in the first week of uh, October is exactly where the, this index stopped here today. And so for those of you that believe in that concept of old resistance becoming new support, maybe there's a, there's a reason that uh, you might you know keep the Russell 2000 on your radar if the markets do turn around and get a little bit more bullish again. All right, let's stop on over here to the internet briefly. I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you that help support this presentation. Uh, and as I always say, as long as we're up and over 100 likes on Twitter, I'm happy to do the full length video, which is why I'm doing it right now. This video would have been done uh, 20 minutes ago if that was not the case. Uh, and we needed some last minute bailing out from our classmates uh, here today as well, I might add. So we were at like 92 likes this morning. And usually when we're at 92 likes in the morning uh, that when I'm scheduled to do the video, we usually don't get the, that final eight likes in the rest of the day. So I was fully expecting to come into tonight's video with no trade application example and only a 15 minute video. So each one of your likes is incredibly and critically important if you really like these long form videos and you wanna see what my trade ideas are. Now again, if you don't like that, that's fine. I know I can get uh, quite long winded. Uh, brevity has never been a strong point of mine. And so for those of you that are like yada, 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 Brandon, let's just get on with things. Give me the, the, the quick and dirty uh, 15 minute, that's fine as well. Then if that's the case, then don't click like. But for those of you that do like the extra content and want us to do that, then we just simply ask that you take five seconds out of your day and click like for us there on Twitter. And we really appreciate all of you that uh, are willing to help us along with that. Also, uh, while we're over here, let's talk about the factor selector tool. A reminder that this gets put together on uh, with Tuesday night's closing price information and then gets posted to our, Wednes uh, our, our, our website on Wednesday morning. So it's a couple days stale by now, but can still give us a good heads up as to what's going on out there from a factor perspective. And you can see that momentum stayed in the top spot for the fifth straight week. And like I was mentioning to my, my factor class yesterday morning, if that number of fifth straight week on top sounds familiar, it's because it should. And I don't believe it's a coincidence. Energy was in its top spot for the fifth straight week on the sector selector, as I showed you guys on Tuesday night. And I personally believe that those two are basically tied at the hip right now. So when energy is doing well, the momentum factor at this moment will also do well. If energy falls out of favor, then you should anticipate that momentum also will. Momentum is basically just price chasing. What are the what are the stocks or the areas of the market that are doing the best on a relative basis? And right now it's the energy stocks, so they're the ones that basically drive what's happening with momentum. Um, you did see that value held up pretty well in the number two position. Uh, not only is energy also an important component within value, but so is financials. And financials have also started to catch 
a little bit of a bid in the marketplace as they were the number two sector in the sector selector that I shared with you there on Tuesday. So I think it's the combination of financials and energy that is allowing value to do well. Dividend yield also bumped up a couple of spots. That's kind of your Dow Jones industrial average effect where your blue chips are doing quite a bit better than your mega cap tech. And then speaking of mega cap tech, that's the reason quality is at the bottom. Remember, there's only three AAA companies in the United States, Microsoft, Apple, and Johnson & Johnson. And since two of those are technology companies, you can think of technology as being incredibly influential on the quality factor funds at this moment in time. Also, earlier today, we, also, uh, we of course had lots of great content for our premium members. David taught his portfolio management with ETFs class, and then I taught my question and answer session with my students, which is kind of a free-for-all where they get a chance to work with me directly on questions that they have uh, about you know stocks that they're looking at or just different concepts that we're talking about in classes lately and things like that. So uh, we talked about uh, my opening commentary on the FOMC decision and some of the history of markets and cycles. Uh, we got a question on clarifying what actually took place with that CrowdStrike uh, put trade there, uh, and the emphasis being that we bought puts there, not the typical approach that I use, which is selling puts. I would have never sold a put on CrowdStrike there, so I hope that was abundantly clear in my commentary on Tuesday, and we went back and listened to it, and it was. So for, for hopefully for most of you, it was uh, very obvious that that was the case. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, that was a long put trade, not a short put trade. Uh, and then I got a question on VF Corp. And how do we think about companies that have really high dividend yields and their, their potential of cutting the dividend? I also got a question about essential utilities and their business model as a water utility company and whether that would make a good dividend growth investing candidate. I got a question about reallocating funds within a DGI portfolio within a specific sector like the REITs where we talked about an apartment REIT, a retail REIT, uh, a self-storage REIT, and kind of had some talking points around how, we, how do we think about that type of a technique at a high level. We also got a question about how to sort and filter the CCC spreadsheet, which we use in our dividend growth investing classes, and then got a question about how the Dow Jones is constructed and uh, how some companies don't really seem to be a very good fit for that index like Walgreens and which companies might very well replace them at some point. So if any of that content sounds interesting to those of you that are premium members, you're welcome to check that out. That recording has been posted to our website. And remember, that is one of the perks of the three-year premium members that we have. The monthly plus members get access to our eight trading rooms, but we try to do a lot of extra perks for our three-year premium members. So not only do they get the eight trading rooms, but they also get the two additional um, question and answer sessions that David and I hold each week. So uh, that gives those folks an opportunity to work directly with David and I. All right, let's go ahead and get back on track now. Uh, with some more charting analysis and do some 12 grid analysis here, starting with chart 5A. This is our asset class 12 grid. And per usual, my eyes drift to the lower two corners. Remember I said that on Tuesday as well. And at that time, uh, we didn't have both of them in the green territory. Well, here we are two days later, and this is why my eyes always drift down there because they are the market's chief concerns right now. And when those two bottom corners are lit up in the green, stock market participants do not like that. So that's why it always has my attention whenever we pull up this 12 grid. So let's start in at the bottom, just like we have for the better part of this year whenever I bring this up. So let's start in the lower left-hand corner with the US dollar. And you can see that the dollar has rallied furiously here in the last couple of days since that FOMC announcement. Uh, we are back up another 0.83%, which is a big move for uh, a big currency like the US dollar. And you can see that we're basically up at this level of resistance of where it kind of topped out before, but there is some pretty decent momentum behind this. Remember when we talked about it on Tuesday, I was saying this was a little bit of a conflicting chart because you could really see it each either way. And I was saying that we would likely know which direction it's going to break in the coming two days. And I think we now have our answer. It appears to me like it's going to be breaking higher, and that's bad news for the stock market. 
Now, the reason I had mentioned that it was in conflict on Tuesday is because we were in a situation where the moving average was still going up, but we were trading below that moving average. Notice today that is different. That moving average color has gone back to green, telling us that price is back above a rising moving average. And because of those prior instances, remember I pulled up the one year chart of this on Tuesday, not just this three month view, where I showed you there were two other times throughout the last year where we had a very similar situation where we were kind of on the brink of breaking down on the US dollar only for them to pull a rabbit out of their hat at the last second and then continue that upward ascent. And that's exactly what appears to be happening here in real time. And again, that's not good for the US, or it's not good for the stock market in general. Um, in the other uh, corner is the US Treasury yield. And of course, that's the other major problem that the stock market has. It does not want to see higher interest rates. Higher interest rates typically mean lower profits for uh, publicly traded companies, all else being equal. And it also means there's a legitimate trade-off effect that takes place for income-seeking investors. So, um, you know, this is not positive news for stock market participants. Like the U.S. dollar, we've seen a pretty tremendous bounce higher in yields. Now, we did close well off the highs today, so perhaps that is maybe one little, you know, nugget of enthusiasm there. But that's still hard to get excited about because this was still a pretty big up day despite closing near the lows of the session. This is still a rather big move for the U.S. Treasury yield. We are at 4.12% on the 10-year right now, so well above 4%. Remember, last week we were having a couple of those days where we we snuck our head below the 4% level. I was talking about how important that level was. And we can now see that the mar market, after hearing Jay Powell's comments, believes that there is future interest rate hikes on the horizon. And so no surprise that that led to a sell-off in bonds with the long-term U.S. Treasuries down a half a percent today, foreign bonds were down 0.3%, and high-yield bonds were down 0.71%. And again, remember, that's a, uh, a way to judge risk appetite there as well. So we don't like to see high-yield bonds down even worse than those other categories because it's basically saying that there is more fear in the system right now, once again, that there could be more defaults on some of those junk bonds that are out there. And we're back below a falling 30-day moving average just like that on the high-yield bond market. Remember, for a while there, things were looking rather good. We had a pretty nice little break out there, but look at how quickly that got unwound once uh, the Fed quiet period uh, just withered away uh, on the vine as of yesterday afternoon. In terms of some of those stock areas up above, you did find that Chinese stocks outperformed today. So uh, emerging markets actually did close barely in the green. So that was somewhat impressive. Now the problem is they're still trading below their falling 30 day moving average. So you're not going to get overly excited about a bullish move there. It could very well develop, but right now it would be a gamble to take that type of a move until it started spending a bit more time above there. Let's go ahead and take a look at our uh, sectors now. And we'll pull up chart 5C for those of you that are following along at home. And as we pull this up here, you can see that we now have a few more pink charts on the board. Remember when I was with you on Tuesday, we had just two. And those two were communications and discretionary. And uh, nothing has improved in those uh, areas at all in the, in the last two days since I've last been with you. So no surprise, we retain those strongly bearish postures there. In fact, it's gotten considerably worse for communications. This is a sector that just cannot get out of its own way this year. And here we are yet again, uh, four days in a row to the downside, breaking to new yearly lows on communications. Remember, that's where you're going to find a stock like Alphabet that I showed you on the heat map that was down 4% today. That's where you're going to find Meta that lost 25% of its value in one fell swoop last week. So there's a lot of stocks in there that were once highly coveted by the market. Now the market is reconsidering their positions there and what kind of valuations they want to give those types of companies. And you can see that the trend is most decidedly bearish and bearish and more bearish on communications. And discretionary doesn't look all that much better. Uh, it has not broken to fresh lows yet, but if we have a bad day in the stock market tomorrow, we could very well get to fresh yearly lows on discretionary as well. So keep your eye on that possibility. Um, in terms of areas that are doing a little bit better, oh, and by the way, here's technology. Notice that technology is back to a weekly bearish posture. Now, remember, that was not the case on, uh, on Tuesday. 
Uh, despite that, I still did the CrowdStrike uh, bearish trade. Uh, and that is part of the story there where CrowdStrike and so many of those software companies have just gotten crunched uh, are crushed in the last couple of days. So this is a four day sell off here for technology as well. And that was an aggressive enough move to push the posture back to weekly bearish. And you can see that the moving average color is back to red with that um, price being below a falling moving average again. So not a good look there at all for technology. Technology, communications, and discretionary are three of the most important sectors out there if you wanted to be bullish in the market. That's where you're gonna find your growth compounders. So it is mighty unfortunate that those are the exact areas that are doing the worst right now and does not bode well for the market at large considering some of the mega cap um, you know, uh, market caps in those areas. Facebook, Google over here in communications, Microsoft, Apple in technology, and Tesla and uh, Amazon in discretionary. All those kind of fit into the same corner of the investor's mindset, and it is not a bullish picture at this moment in time. In terms of where our bullishness was today, uh, you can give that award to energy. Once again, it was the leader of this market. It was up 1.85% today. Of course, retains its strongly bullish posture and is still trading above its rising moving average. Um, another kind of uh, honorable mention in that regard is industrials. Industrials was up 1.05% today, obviously not near its three month highs like energy is, but still well above its rising moving average with that strongly bullish posture. And so um, remember when we were looking at the, the, the heat map earlier today, we shouldn't be surprised to learn that those were the two areas that were up the most because that's where we saw the most consistent green with Conoco and Exxon and Chevron leading the way there in the energy world. And then John Deere and Boeing and Caterpillar and all those defense contractors that I rattled off uh, and along with uh, you know Emerson Electric and all those companies did quite well. So notice here the proof is in the pudding. Uh, both of those areas were up over 1% here today. So they were our shining stars. All right, let's get into our trade application example. And um, before I leave the sector view, just take a peek here real quick at the financials, kind of rolling over at this lower high peak here. We're not to a bearish posture yet, but I just want you to kind of recognize that because that will play a role in our trade application example here tonight. So uh, I want to come on over here to chart. Uh, let's do 3A here for this discussion. Actually, you know what? I wanted to do this. In fact, I was just tweeting about this. So some of you already know what my trade application e example is. Of course, if you're a premium member, you already know because I already telegrammed that out to you when the stock market was open. But even if you're not a premium member and you just simply follow me on Twitter, sometimes I will let you know in advance uh, what I'll be talking about in the video uh, that night. And I just got done posting here not too long ago about Goldman Sachs and how I was going to be doing a bearish trade on it for the video tonight. Uh, and what I wanted to, to kind of emphasize in that tweet was something that was very rare that had happened to, to Goldman Sachs. Um, in the midst of this pretty uh, you know, strong rally that we've had here uh, over the last month or so, Goldman Sachs has been one of the stalwarts. And of course, it helped that they reported their earnings there early in that journey. But um, notice that Goldman Sachs was up nine days in a row. That's true, right there. All those green bars stacked up right next to each other. Those, that's nine trading days in a row with gains, and many of them 1% plus moves along the way. And in fact, when I placed my bearish trade on Goldman Sachs here today, which was about an, a half an hour before the market closed, it was actually up at that time. It was slightly above like 350. So it wasn't until the final half an hour where it did fall 92 cents. So if it wasn't for that final half an hour, this could have actually been the 10th day in a row for Goldman Sachs, which... I went back and unless I overlooked it, because I, I, I did go through it pretty quickly because I needed to get on with things for the day, but I went back over the last 10 years worth of data and I did not see a single other instance of nine days in a row to the upside like we just completed here. Uh, I did see an eight uh, and I did see a seven, but I did not see nine days in a row like we just witnessed here for Goldman Sachs. So this is incredibly rare. And while that probably sounds good on the surface, remember that at some point a reversion has to take place. And so it makes you wonder if they've gone up a little bit too consistently and now they need to give back some of those gains along the way. In fact, I thought there was maybe, yeah, within the last year, right here, we had a, a rather long instance as well where we had one, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven. So it's still not nine like we just had here, but over here we had seven days in a row to the upside on these candles up above. And you'll notice on that seventh candle that completed that, that set, that was the high, right? And that is the high that we're, we're contending with right now. After that seventh day in a row, we had a very ugly sell-off in Goldman Sachs. And the trade idea that I'll be doing tonight is a bearish trade idea. Um, so let's go over here to uh, chart 3A and finish up that conversation. So when I was with you on Tuesday, I did a long put trade. And as I stated at that time, that is very rare for me. You will count them on one hand the amount of times I've done just a straight up uh, buying of a naked put, right? Uh, all by itself, a single, you know, contract, not in a spread type of a trade. So that is a very aggressive trade because as I said on Tuesday, uh, you have the risk of time decay eating away and eroding the value of your contract. And more times than not, you will be a loser when you buy calls and puts. Uh, thankfully at this moment in time, it looks like we're going to be big time winners with that trade. So maybe we got lucky there, but in general, you do want to limit the amount of times that you just straight up buy a call or straight up buy a put because you do have risk of that extrinsic value being too costly to you when you purchase the contract. So one way to kind of offset that is to kind of construct a spread to offset the costs of a long put trade and still have a bearish bent on the, the, the chart that you are trading. And so that's what I opted to do in this case. As I mentioned to you a moment ago, at the time I placed the trade, the stock was actually trading a little bit above 350. It wasn't until the last half an hour that it sold off again. But at that time, um, you know, it wasn't quite below 350. And what we usually do when we do long contracts, long uh, spreads like this, is we buy one in the money and sell one out of the money. So at that time, technically, the one that was in the money was the 355 strike, and the one that was out of the money at that exact moment was the 350 strike. Now, unlike the crowd strike trade that I did on Tuesday, in this case, I did the December contracts. Remember with CrowdStrike, that was a November contract. So that one was a little bit more timely, I guess. This one can spend a bit of time playing out if it needs to. And what this is, is it's a bearish bet on this particular security. And you can see that after the last couple of days, you now see the blue background of the chart go to pink because this blue line has fallen out of favor and you've got a little bit of a bearish near-term divergence there. It's not as evident as some of those others I showed you earlier in the presentation, but still you have a little element of that. But despite it going up yesterday, it actually changed to a bearish near-term posture. So that was one interesting clue that I had. Another interesting clue is the fact that you had a long upper shadow yesterday where we barely just missed knocking out that previous high. So there might have been some sellers up in that area. And then today you had this long lower shadow. Now remember long lower shadows can be bullish, but it depends on where do you see them on the chart. If that type of a candle shows up down below here, we would say that it's a, it, it resembles something a little bit closer to a hammer formation, which is actually a bullish reversal pattern. But up here, you would call that a hanging man. Uh, there's probably better terminology for it, but the old school way of what you would call that is close to a hanging man. I know it's not exactly the same because you do have a long, you have a short candle or a short wick up at the top there. But that's the impression that it gives. And just like it sounds, a hanging man is not typically a good thing. Uh, that is typically a bad thing for the market. And it gives you the sense that it just didn't have the energy to get going up higher and it's running out of energy because it exerted so much energy getting off the bottom on an intraday basis that it just couldn't quite close in the green today. So it, it appears to my eye like you're kind of stalling out here on Goldman Sachs just a touch lower than where the high was back here in August. And therefore, because it's gone up nine days in a row prior to today, it could very well spend some time giving that back. So again, what I did was uh, a long put spread where I bought the 355 put in December, I sold the 350 put in December, combined that together for this long, uh, bull, uh, this long bear 
put spread, if you want to call it that way. Sometimes people refer to it as a bear put spread because it's it emphasizes in the name of the of the strategy uh, what direction you want that security to go. So remember, if you were selling a put spread, you would be bullish. That is not what I'm doing here. I am buying a put spread and I'm, I am bearish and I want this stock to go lower. And ideally what I want is for the stock to close below 350 on expiration day there in December. And I had to pay a debit of $2.50 out of my pocket uh, to establish this trade. But because of the range of the spread itself being $5 from 355 down to 350, my upside potential is to make $2.50. So I'm spending 250 to try to make 250 in profits. In other words, it's a possibility of a 100% return on my risk here with this trade, but what needs to happen with it is for this stock to close below 350 on expiration day there in the middle of December. And who knows whether that's going to happen or not. Uh, some people would say this is a little bit of a gamble because this stock does have relative strength, and that is true. But my answer to that is, does it have too much relative strength? Because it is incredibly rare for this stock to go up nine days in a row, and does it now need to give some back, especially if the market at large is starting to tear in a little bit more bearish once again, okay? So that's what I had for you here today. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you did, I ask one simple request out of you. It doesn't cost you a penny. It just costs you five seconds of your time. And for a lot of you, you think that's a pretty good trade-off for the three hours that I have to put into producing this free video. And all I ask you to do is just click like for me there on Twitter. As long as we're up and over 100 likes by the time I'm scheduled to do the video again on Tuesday, I'll plan on doing another full-length video just like this one that will include a nice trade example at the end. On the other hand, if you're sick of hearing me rambling on and on and you want a 15-minute quick hit video uh, that does not include uh, a trade application example and it does not include all the 12 grid analysis and all my extra insight then don't click like and if we're under a hundred likes on on uh, Tuesday then I'll just plan on doing a very quick video there for you so either way I'm fine with because remember this is not how we get paid so this is not really um, you know our, our main mode of monetization or anything like that so it doesn't matter to me uh, it, it, what it matters for is you guys and what you you care about and what you desire if you desire the shorter videos, no likes. If you desire the longer videos, click like. Easy enough. All right. Uh, with that, I want to wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Remember, tomorrow's an important day with the jobs number, so stay tuned to David's analysis tomorrow night as well, and I'll see all the rest of you uh, next week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.